Kuop Cheng. Before I proceed, I want to declare um, an interest. I have ransacked my family vaults. I have found no letter from Mr. Benjamin Disraeli to my great grandfather <laughs> or, or any other member of my family. Mr. Speaker, it is a great honour to be invited to second the humble address, which was proposed so eloquently by my honourable friend, the member for Newbury. Yeah. He was both charming and funny, and that is a much rarer quality than you could expect, uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> It's wonderful to see everything in its place. We have you, Mr. Speaker. We have the government. We have a government. We have the leader of the opposition. In its place. All's well with the world. I'm even delighted to see, I'm even delighted to see our old friends, our special friends, uh, the Liberal Democrats, in their place. Albeit without a leader, but we can live with that for a while. Still brimming with enthusiasm. <laughs> Election day, as we all know, was full of surprises. When the exit poll was revealed, when the exit poll was revealed, there were gasps of anguish, despair and deep, bitter disappointment. And that was only the members of the Parliamentary Labour Party. We all know, we all know how hard the business, we all know how hard the business of putting together a government has been. We know how torturous uh, the process has been, the debates, the tensions, the difficulties, and we were able to follow every detail closely in the highly objective, scrupulously fair pages of the Evening Standard. Yeah. <laughs> it is a great privilege for me, it is a great privilege for me, the son of Ghanaian immigrants who came to this country in the 1960s to perform this duty today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother lived in Liverpool where her elder brother was studying medicine. She remembers Sir Winston Churchill's funeral and Liverpool winning the FA Cup. She certainly would never have believed that her only son would become a British Member of Parliament. This is one of the strengths of this country. Now I know, I know uh, people are wondering, uh, the custom is for this speech to be, to be delivered by a young thrusting MP. Yeah. After seven years in this House, I was slightly confused about this description. Uh, one of the, uh, my uh, honourable friends, a former whip, said, oh, you're meant to be the young one, are you? <laughs> in my intake of 2010, I have seen such meteoric high flyers as a business secretary, a home secretary, and even a Lord Chancellor. And then there's me. <laughs> May I reassure members May I reassure the Prime Minister, I am still young, <laughs> still thrusting. The occasion, the occasion is also a great honour for my constituency spellthorn. But as an MP, we can all reflect that politics is not all about set-piece occasions and big speeches. When first I walked down the high street in Ashford, I wondered how I would be treated. An elderly woman came up to me and said, rather surprisingly, Mr. Kwartang, I'm going to vote for you. Then I made the fatal mistake. I asked the question no candidate should ever ask. <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, I don't know, she said. I like seeing your smiley face in the newspaper. <laughs> we must never attempt to second guess at every stage our voters' motivations. The borough I have the honour to represent has so many political and historic associations. Staines, of course, was where the barons assembled before forcing King John to sign the Magna Carta in Runnymede. It was in Staines that Sir Thomas More, one of your less fortunate predecessors, Mr Speaker, was tried before 
his execution on Tower Hill. May you avert that fate. <laughs> One of my recent predecessors, Sir Humphrey Atkins, was Chief Whip and then Northern Ireland Secretary in turbulent times. These days, my constituency is very much a place of business with a range of enterprises from small startups to global companies such as Shepparton Studios and BP. Spellthorn has a thriving business community, which is, of course, greatly helped by our location with excellent links uh, to London and Heathrow Airport, I should suggest to you. <laughs> to you, Mr. Speaker. There is also a great innovative spirit in my constituency, and with a study as recently as 2015 concluding that Stains upon Thames was the number one town in the country to start a new business with three times as many startups every year as the UK average. Despite changes in the way we do business and the technology that we use, Mr. Speaker, the traditions of this House have withstood the onslaught of time. You, Mr. Speaker, uphold the great traditions of this House and our parliamentary system. These institutions have evolved and remain. How could I put this? I was at a loss for words. I was thinking of a phrase, of course, strong and stable. <laughs> I'm delighted. I'm delighted. I'm delighted that the government's programme is ambitious. The, the, the government's programme is ambitious. We have Brexit. And when we look at the Great Repeal Bill, we have to consider what a great and significant piece of legislation it is. The original European Communities Act was passed in 1972. Feelings were so strong at that time that it took 300 hours of parliamentary debate before that bill was passed. Feelings are no less strong today because the future of the country is at stake. The complexities of the Great Repeal Bill will be debated extensively in the next two years. It will be a great landmark, a great landmark, in the parliamentary and constitutional history of this country. A new immigration bill will seek, rightly, to reduce migration to sustainable levels. And once passed, both these acts, both these acts will shape Britain very considerably in the years ahead. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, the last few months have been, by any standards, horrific. I never thought I would live to see barriers erected on Westminster Bridge. The attacks on innocent people, even within the parliamentary estate, or most recently at the Finsbury Park Mosque, have rightly disgusted the overwhelming majority of decent people in this country. Neither did I think I would see a tower with 500 people sleeping in their homes go up in flames. The appalling scenes of devastation in West London last week can never be forgotten. We can talk of tradition, we can talk of history, but at a time like the present we must be mindful of human suffering. It was at times like last week that we in this House are reminded of the solemn duties and grave responsibilities we have been called upon by our constituents and the whole country to discharge. The recent terrible events remind us of the awe-inspiring trust with which we have been endowed, and it is in this rather sombre and reflective mood that I commend the gracious speech to the House. Yeah.